Welcome back to the Nervon channel. Tonight, we are going to use my observatory's largest scope. This is a 6,500 millimeter focal length to photograph the moon. Now, doing it with a scope this big is a challenge. And I'll give you some tips to make it a little bit easier. When you have a focal length as long as this one is, you're never gonna get the entire moon in there. And probably one of the hardest things of all is gonna be just getting the thing in focus. Now, a batting off mask on a separate star is a nice thing to do. Unfortunately, I don't have a batting off mask. So, what I'm using is focus peaking, and in focus peaking settings, I set the focus peaking brightness to the highest level because it's gonna it be a little faint. Now, some tips for like composition with something like this as long a focal length is probably to get like the, the edges where basically you've got points coming together. Like for example, right now we're kind of shooting the top edge of the moon. We can see the end of the illumination of the moon and, and that's kind of a more interesting topic, so to speak. Now, how you image something like this, don't even bother trying to take single images. What you'll need to do is take video footage of it and then we'll take that video footage and we'll stack those thousands and thousands of frames to find the sharpest ones and put them all together. So, I actually, I actually, so I'm actually gonna start that right now. Let's make some video. And of course, don't touch the camera or anything like that. We'll let that run for a little bit. So I was just down in the main building eating some tortilla chips with some of the other members that are out here tonight. We've got about seven or eight people here tonight. And then, and I was thinking to myself, I was like, man, the, the moon keeps on moving out of the field of view really quickly with this thing. Is, is it really that out of alignment? And, and then I remembered that this mount has a button on it you got to press for lunar tracking rate. So make sure if your mount does that, okay, especially with a big scope like this, you got to have lunar tracking selected. Uh, if you don't have lunar tracking selected, it'll, it'll drift out of field of view very, very quickly. And, and even though we're, we're shooting video footage here, you know, which is very, very short frames, we still, we still want to be able to keep the thing centered up as long as we can so that we can, you know, capture a nice image when we stack all those frames together. So yeah, make sure you select lunar tracking rate on your mount. It's, the moon actually moves, I think it's, it's one third slower than the rest of the sky. So it, it's a significant difference and you will, you will see it very quickly through an eyepiece if you're just viewing it visually or if you're trying to do what I'm doing tonight. Now I use program mode when I'm, when I'm shooting video. To make sure that it's getting a correct exposure, you're gonna to wanna to tap on the section of screen where the moon is in frame. If you're metering out there in the dark area where it's not you know, illuminated, obviously you're gonna have a really overblown image. You lose all your details in the highlights. I want to tell you a little bit about this scope. So this is, it's not the oldest scope at our observatory, but it's one of the older ones. It's in the oldest building. This building is the very first one that was erected in the 1950s. And the actual tube of the scope, okay, is actually a big concrete form, which has about 30 coats of paint on it. So it's, it's, it's essentially a tube of enamel, if you will, <laughs> at this point. The mount, I, uh, I and a couple other members here, actually it was a big project. The whole observatory was involved. Uh, we took this thing completely apart and totally rebuilt it. We had the, the mirrors on it recoated and surfaced and, and just, you know, really, really tuned this thing up. And it's a much more fun scope to use now that it's kind of been tuned up, so to speak. Some things I wish about it, you know, I wish it was a go-to mount. You know, this mount is from the eighties or maybe even earlier than that, you know, and, and here's another kind of fun fact. So it's an F 15 scope. So very, very slow, but you know, for visual that's perfect. Okay. And also for lunar stuff and moon photography, you know, that's, that's also pretty fine too. It's not a big deal to have a slow scope for, for lunar photography. Now, another fun fact though about this scope is that the finer scope on it, it's a big 90 millimeter objective binocular piece. It was actually a binocular, it was half of a binocular piece that was taken off of a Japanese sub during World War II. You know, at the end of the war, of course, they were demilitarizing everything and sadly, a lot of those optics just got dumped into the bay at Tokyo, which is really kind of unfortunate. But 
you know, a bunch of people did grab some of these. They recognized that the optics in these binoculars that were on these submarines were very, very good quality, and so they, they repurposed them and turned them into small telescopes. And on ours, we have it in use here as a, basically our finder scope for this big monster. So it's been a few weeks, okay? And yes, I've been wrestling with this data, trying to tease good details out of it because, you know, stacking 4K data is just painful with planetary stacking software. You know, by the way, if you are a software guy and you would like to write some software for astronomy, please do some planetary for the stacking software because all the other ones that are out there are just crap, okay? They are horrible, they're extremely slow. I basically throw my 4K video in there and my machine's no slouch, okay? It's got 120 gigs of RAM. But, you know, basically I, I, I go make dinner and come back a few hours later, okay? It takes a while to stack this 4K stuff. And in retrospect, I think when I redo this, okay, which I am definitely gonna go back on the observatory and try this again, because this was a lot of fun, is I am going to reshoot this time maybe at 720p. And I'm actually not going to lose any resolution doing that. And that's because this enormous telescope with a 6,500 millimeter focal length puts me in a very oversampled state. And there was even a member there who kind of mentioned, it's like, man, you're really oversampled right now. Now, I know a lot of you don't know what that means, and I'm gonna explain, okay? So oversampling, let's, let's imagine, okay, let's take the atmosphere, okay, is our lens, okay? It's what we're looking through, and everybody has to look through it. Now, there are certain parts of the globe where the atmosphere is thinner, okay? Like on the tops of mountains, where like Mauna Kea, where the big observatories are. Obviously, they have better scene. They don't have to look through as much air as we do. But down here where I am, I'm only at 350 feet, okay, above sea level. And there's a lot of turbulence in this area, and there's also a lot of jets going through the air. I don't have very good scene, okay? Which means that the resolution of my sky is kind of crappy, okay? And at 6,500 millimeters, even though that classic case of grand scopes that we have has exceptionally good optics, yeah, it, basically the image looks blurry, okay? And let me explain to you, okay? So let's imagine that this lens, okay, is only able to deliver to us five megapixels of resolution, okay? Just five. Now the sensor in it is a 20 megapixel sensor. So we could actually take our sensor, okay, and we could take all the pixels in it and we could bend them together two by two. So like, think of this here as four pixels, okay? We're bending them together two by two. We're basically digitally, or through hardware that's in the sensor itself, um, combining those pixels together, making them bigger, okay? And therefore more sensitive because they're larger, all right? And because we've already got a limit of five megapixels to our lens, which is the atmosphere in this particular situation, we're going from 20 megapixels to five megapixels, the sensor, and we're not losing any resolution. However, we're gaining a tremendous amount of sensitivity because we're using much larger pixels now. So when I go and do this again, I think I will try and do this maybe at 720 DPI, maybe even 480, we'll see. But the pictures of Orion that I took, you know, they're, they're kind of blurry and everything. But it's crazy because occasionally I would get one or two subs that are very, very sharp. Okay, and you'll actually see more stars in the picture than you would in, in the other ones. And and I, when I was going through these pictures, I was actually really subjective, and I mostly got rid of all the ones where I, I saw the least number of stars. But but this is essentially what I'm doing is is I'm actually doing what's called lucky imaging. And I kind of want to make you aware, like this is kind of where the industry is eventually going to go, is as sensors get better and better, and as the read noise in them gets lower and lower. I mean, we're, I know this, this particular guy right here, at best he does 1.2 electrons of noise per, per photon of light, okay? Some of the new sensors that are coming out though are getting really good. There's a new one out there by a company. It, this thing is insane, it's, it's, it's like, 0.2 photon or electrons per photon of light. It's just insane how low they're getting. The world's first commercially available CMOS photon counting sensor that has achieved the world's lowest read noise. And because of this incredibly low noise level, 
taking lots and lots of exposures rather than taking long exposures is going to be less of a difference. There's going to be less of a difference between the two. And we'll be able to do more of these shorter exposures. And we could someday get to the point where sensors, you know, we can take thousands upon thousands of one second exposures. What that means is we'll be able to do lucky imaging, essentially. And we'll be able to basically take only those subs that are the sharpest, okay? You know, kind of like we do with planetary photography. And we'll be able to use just those to essentially break the whole oversampling rule that has been in effect for a very long time. So what is oversampled today, 10 years from now, people are going to be using lucky imaging technology basically and these very, very low readout noise sensors that will allow them to take thousands of short one second exposures and essentially do lucky imaging and therefore break the oversampling rule that has kind of like held a lot of amateur astrophotography back. So that's kind of the future, okay? So should you ever really worry about oversampling though with Olympus cameras, not if you're using any of their lenses, okay? Any of the lenses that Olympus has, even the new 150 to 400, it's not gonna be oversampled in the average sky, okay? And even in some of the worst skies, you're not gonna be oversampled. It's really when you get into those very, very long focal lengths, you know, over a thousand millimeter focal length, that's where things start to get hairy. But you know, I hope you found this interesting and you know, Give the moon a try, it's a neat target. Also give Orion a try. It's such a bright thing in the sky and just one picture will show you details in it that will probably amaze you. And if you like my videos, hey, please like and subscribe. Thank you.